Welcome to our uh, our forest in a changing climate green drinks. Here is my document. Um, my name is Ginevra. I'm the program director at Sustainable Woodstock. We are a nonprofit. We were founded in 2009, and we're an environmental action and education organization that builds on Woodstock's legacy as birthplace of the modern conservation movement. Our vision promotes vibrant, inclusive, thriving communities where we live sustainably now and in the future. We've come to one of our monthly green drinks. These are social events to connect people who, and educate people who have similar interests in the environment. We invite nonprofits, businesses, individuals, organizations to make short presentations that highlight sustainability and green initiatives in our area and um, extending beyond just the Upper Valley and Vermont sometimes. Um, we've been hosting these events virtually for quite a while and have gotten a great um, response and attendees. And I do want to call out that our June and July green drinks will be in person um, due to the nature of the topic. So I'll just quickly, quickly um, give a shout out to next month's green drinks, which will be on June 29th, titled No Till, Gardening Without Disturbance. As we learn about the significance of soil life, we find out that disturbing soil is no longer recommended, but how do we transition away from tillage? And we'll be joined by Kat Buxton to demonstrate some ways to do that. That'll be in Woodstock at our community garden. And I'll send out the registration info after this event. It's kind of exciting to be doing some things in person and outdoors. I would like to just give a brief thank you to Tim Stout of North Am Forest Carbon for making the connection to Ali and helping to make this event happen. We're really grateful to him and his work. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, read your bio here, Ali, so folks know you. Ali Kasiba is a forest ecophysiologist and extension assistant professor of forestry at the University of Vermont. As the extension forester, she creates resources and conducts applied research to help landowners foresters and decision makers to better understand the impacts of climate change and other stressors on Vermont's forest and management techniques to improve forest resilience. Ali serves as a regional educator on forest carbon science and management and is the state lead on the Vermont Forest Carbon Inventory. She also works on various forest health topics like planning and management for at-risk tree species land planning for maintaining critical forest services and forest monitoring. So we're very excited to have you back. It's been quite a while, Allie, um, and excited to hear uh, what's changed and in the forest carbon world. So take it away. Thanks, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks everyone for, for coming out on this beautiful uh, evening. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about Vermont's forest in a changing climate and what you can do if you're a landowner um, or encourage other landowners or inform policy. I guess if you're not a landowner, there's lots of things we all can do um, to steward uh, woods, our woods in the future. Um, and I did talk um, to this group. Yeah, I don't exactly remember when that was, but on forest carbon. And there's lots of interactions between what I'm going to talk about today um, and forest carbon. Um, all right. So our, our climate is changing here in Vermont. We know this from long-term records that we have. This is showing um, Burlington weather station, but it's sort of uh, indicative of Vermont uh, uh, climate change. So we have on the left um, annual average temperature that has increased about three degrees since we've have these records, which is the late 1800s. And then precipitation has increased about nine inches, which is a pretty significant percentage increase. I think that's about 25% um, increase in that time. So we're getting, it's warmer and we're getting more, more rain. Um, what has this resulted in, in our, for our forest? Well, we're seeing a longer growing season and many of you have probably recognized that, especially this year. But if you're a gardener, um, you probably are aware of this too. We have about three weeks longer growing season um, since the late 1800s. Um, you can see that in this map. And uh, this has a number of impacts. It's actually, you know, all things uh, aside is good for trees. Uh, our climate is what we call temperature limited, it means 
our trees, our plants are really limited by the length of the growing season, the amount of they can grow each year, the amount of time they have to photosynthesize and make sugars and starches to store, um, have time to flower. All those processes are really limited uh, by temperature and how long that growing season is. So that extends, they have more time to grow. And we actually seen that in tree ring records, which is something that I do I collect tree rings um, from trees and we can see that some species in some locations are actually growing really well um, with climate change. The key to this is that water has to be available um, and water is key to all these processes, including growth and photosynthesis. Um, this also means that trees can put away extra reserves. Um, they might have extra energy for things like flowering or defense chemicals. Of course, uh, these longer growing seasons don't just impact plants and trees, also impacts all the other life in our forests, including, uh, you know, notably our insects uh, and insect pests of, of trees. So defoliators and wood borers and um, all those other insects that can cause uh, decline and even mortality in our trees. So we are seeing that certain insects uh, might have more than one, more generations in a year. Um, so maybe they have one or two generations in a summer with that two weeks extra growing season. They might be able to squeak in a third um, generation or they just have more time, they get bigger. So that means they eat more, they consume more leaf matter, or whatever plant matter they are consuming. So there is some research showing that caterpillars are just bigger um, with this longer growing season. Um, we're also seeing or kind of monitoring these changes for what we call phenological mismatches. So phenology is just a timing of natural events. So that's, you know, when certain plants flower or when certain birds migrate back to Vermont, that's all phenology. Um, what we know is that we could have different species sort of respond to climate change differently. They might not respond at the same rate. And so example of a phenological mismatch, this is this photo is showing uh, American basswood, which is one of our few uh, insect pollinated trees. A lot of our trees are just wind pollinated, so their pollen just gets transported by the wind to a, a female flower, and that's how they're pollinated. But some of our trees, like American basswood, rely on insects. So there could be a situation if these flowers emerge at a different time from their insect pollinators, they might not be able to pollinate, be pollinated. So that's just one example of a phenological mismatch, but there's a lot of other examples, including in the soil um, that uh, folks are monitoring and doing research about. We're also worried about things like spring frost damage, which sounds like reports we had some last night. Um, I was really worried actually about a lot of our tree species last night because they leafed out very early. Um, you know, we have pretty much full canopy for some of our species. Some of our species are leaf out at different times. Notably, ash is a late, you know, it is late to leaf out. So that hasn't fully leafed out. But I haven't seen a lot of damage this morning and today um, in our tree species, but I actually did see some damage in um and not weed, which was actually kind of beneficial as that's, that's an invasive plant. But what we see is when we have this early growing season, really warm springs, we still can get these cold um, temperatures in May. So mid-May is kind of time when we can get these. And these are actually images here I'm showing of sugar maple, which is a really a species that leaves out, it's one of the earliest um, to leaf out of all our native tree species. And the leaves, when they're in this stage, are very sensitive to cold. And so this is actually three different years of frost damage that I captured. Um, and you can see in this top image, the leaves kind of get scorched around the edges. And so they get misshapen. Um, they still can function or sometimes they get so damaged that they, they're completely dead. The trees will reflush a new set of leaves. It's usually not that big of a deal for you know, a mature established tree, they have extra reserves to do this. But you know, the concern would be if it happened multiple years um, and uh, 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 to the same trees, that could be a, a pretty significant stress. Um, oops. The other thing we're seeing, and, and many of you probably are seeing this too, is milder winters. I think this was a good example. This, this winter, we did have that cold snap of you know, negative 20, negative 25 in places, but it was pretty short-lived. 
So we're seeing that on average, our winter temperatures are changing much faster than the rest of the seasons. In fact, two and a half times faster than our annual temperature. So it's a season that's changing the most. Um, and you can see that in this map, um, the Northeast region and so the lake states have experienced um, you know, about four degrees uh, increase in our winter temperatures. Milder winters uh, mean a few things for our trees. Uh, one thing is, one way to look at this is by plant hardiness zones. Again, if you're a gardener, if you have uh, plants around your house that you have um, introduced and planted, you might be aware of this, but plant hardiness zones really just describe the minimum winter temperature expected at that location. And that's really um, a threshold for many plants. If they can't withstand that minimum winter temperature, they uh, they're, you know, they might have bud damage or stem damage or just completely die. Um, and so currently most of our state is, you know, zone four, zone five. So that's minimum winter temperature of negative 30, maybe negative 20. Um, the projection for the end of the century, and granted this is a model, this is far in advance, is for those plant hardiness zones to change pretty dramatically so that, you know, most of our state would be six, seven, or eight zone. And so for context, that is plants like southern magnolia or pecan uh, that we could technically plant here and they would survive if those are the zones that we have in the future. So that's a significant change um, in our cold winters. We also um, can see some benefit to some of our trees, our native trees here um, with uh, less cold winters. We do have a number of species here in Vermont that are marginally cold hardy. Um, so that means that most of their range extends down in the Southern United States. An example of that is on the left is American chestnut. American chestnut, maybe many of you know, was really a dominant, amazing tree on the Eastern forest and it was decimated by introduced chestnut blight. Partially decimated too, why people cut it down thinking that all of them would be lost. So we don't know, there might've been some natural resistance in the species. We don't have a lot of examples. There are sprouts that pop up in Vermont. We don't have many mature trees except for those have been planted, but they are susceptible to cold damage. Um, you, this is the range of the historic range of American chestnut and it really extended in the Champlain Valley and the Connecticut River Valley. So it's sort of our warmer pockets in our state. Um, and it was really, it's limited by the cold winters. And so one projection is that we might see chestnut be able to survive um, in places that it historically couldn't. And even some of our other species that we think of being very cold hardy, this is a photo of red spruce, a, a species that I've studied um, a lot. It is actually a species that grows well into Appalachia south of us, and it does suffer from cold damage. Um, it was a uh, relationship with acid rain and causing this damage, but it was really this cold damage that happened over the winter. Uh, we call it winter injury. And so, you know, there are some benefits from milder winters and we could see less winter injury on some of these plants. But of course, as I mentioned earlier with the longer growing season, these changes affect all aspects of our forests and insects are another part of this that, get, that uh, might see some changes from milder winters. One example, of this is I'm showing here is hemlock woolly adelgid. That's a hemlock tree. This is what the, the adelgid looks like. That's actually sort of a, what's called an ovisac. So it's a covering over these little insects. Um, it's very small, but it causes incredible damage to hemlock trees um, and has done that down in Virginia, North Carolina, and other places in the central Appalachians where it's been established for quite a long time. Uh, much longer than here in Vermont. In Vermont, it's limited to southern southern part of their state because the, the, the insect is killed by minimum uh, lethal temperatures in the winter, about like negative 25, um, the, the insects are just killed. Um, and so it's really been restricted to that part of our, our state, but we project that, you know, it, as our winters get warmer, we might see this insect um, sort of march up and expand into other parts of the state. 
What we're also seeing is that we're experiencing more rain in the winter, more rain on snow, um, a shorter duration and less snowpack. So maybe places that used to historically have snow or not seeing snow or even places um, that still have snow, it's not coming and it's, uh, you know, a permanent snowpack isn't being established until maybe January and then it's melting out really early. Um, and so this has a number of consequences um, in our forest. One is that snow acts as an insulative blanket. So it really protects um, roots. It protects, so the, you know, uh, shrubs and smaller plants in the bottoms of, of trees and their root systems from uh, wind damage and really cold um, uh, temperatures in the winter. Um, so a species like sugar maple in particular has very shallow roots. Actually, a lot of trees, they may have roots that go deep for stabilization, but a lot of their what we call feeder roots, so these are the roots that access nutrients, access water, are very small, and they really only extend down maybe a foot. Um, and so this you can actually see in this photo, these are all little feeder roots of sugar maple. And so when we don't have snowpack, those roots can actually be damaged from the cold, so they can suffer from winter injury, or we have more freeze-thaw events in the soil, and that actually physically breaks up the soil. It can break up, uh, just uh, disrupt the roots, break up things like mycorrhizal fungi that are in the soil, and have a number of other processes um, disrupted. Um, so we do know that, that um, snowpack is really important. We're also seeing, because of this sort of milder winter, earlier spring uh, snow melt. And so the peak flows that we're experiencing in our streams um, that are from snow melt in the spring are happening earlier. Um, and so that's just a phenomenon that's that's occurring and could have other um, impacts to, you know, how, when trees leafing out and they need water and uh, flood events and all sorts of different cascading effects. Um, we are seeing hotter summers and in Vermont, you know, we don't have super hot summers. One way that one metric that's used is this um, indice of over 86 degrees. You can see we really don't have that many days that are over 86 degrees in a year. You know, if you're down in the Champlain Valley, Connecticut River Valley, you might have, you know, two weeks of those temperatures, uh, but certainly up in the mountains, uh, about a week or a fewer days. But the projection is that it's going to increase, um, you know, in, in by the end of the century. And one of the things that we're worried about is not just necessarily the hotter summer, the hotter temperature, because we have so few of them. Um, it's not, those aren't lethal temperatures for plants, but it's the interaction between uh, warmer air temperatures and water. So warmer air can hold more water, sort of a physical nature of the relationship between temperature and, 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 and water vapor. And so what, we're, what we see when we have higher temperatures is that there's more evaporation from water. So that can be from surfaces of leaves, that can be from soil, really anything from water bodies will have more evaporation. And so this can cause soil drying, drought stress, um, and sort of all those other impacts. And it's really hard for us to project because there's a lot of variability in soil type, depth of soil, how the water holding capacity of soil. And so we are seeing some increases. You can see in this map, this is drought, drought monitor that's uh, uh, produced um, to show intensity of drought. We are seeing in some places that there have been droughts. We had some in Vermont last summer. Um, this is, you know, most of our mature trees can withstand this. They hold water in their trunks and their roots, and they can tap into some deep resources of water. We are concerned if we see droughts that occur over multiple summers, so multiple years in a row, um, but also even a short-lived drought can have an effect on our, on our seedlings. So showing here sugar maple, right, the sugar maple seedling, the, the roots might only um, uh, extend in the soil six inches or so. And so those, a drought um, could really impact that whole, whole co cohort of um, seedlings for that year. And so this idea of cold loving and warm loving species is one we can use to think about how we move forward and, and what species might be um, more favored in a changing climate. And so in Vermont, um, we are lucky, we have a lot of different tree species. And we have species that what we call our northern species or cold loving species. These, the ranges of these species up here on the top, they extend 
well north of us, up into Canada, right? So this is balsam fir, yellow birch, northern white cedar, sugar maple, uh, and white spruce. And there's others. That's just an example of, of some of them. And they can ex exist in very cold climates. They sort of like cold temperatures. And like I said, they exist well up into Quebec and other parts of, of Canada and, and you know, northern Maine. We also have a suite of species we call southern species or warm loving species. And these are species whose ranges extend well south of us. Um, so these are all of our oaks showing here red oak, but we have lots of different species of oak. All of them have ranges to extend south of us. Our pines, so red pine and eastern white pine are hickories, shagbark hickory showing here bitter nut hickory. Uh, this is white oak um, and then uh, uh, red cedar. Um, and so that's just showing a few of them. We have other species, but those are sort of the species we think in a warming climate will um, do better, be less stressed, be more competitively advantaged. And so we're projecting that these southern species are ones we're going to see expanding in habitat. And these northern species, you know, we're not going to, they're not going to all be lost um, anytime soon, but that they're going to be more stressed. They might be less competitive in a forest system. Um, and just because they sort of rely on those cold conditions, maybe the deep snowpack, uh, and that's what they're adapted to. Uh, as we think about more precipitation, the real big risk here is increase of foliar diseases. So this is when the foliage is just remains wet um, more longer periods. Um, and then you couple that with warmer temperatures and we can see things like this is showing anthracnose, which is a foliar disease. Um, that affects actually a lot of different species. And then on the right, I'm showing white pine uh, needle disease, which we think is, um, I say we, but I'm not one who researches this, but the scientific community thinks this is based on native um, fungi and anthracnose is also native. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, that, that invasive um, fungi will be the only um, species to um, benefit from changing climate. Some of our native fungi too, um, but just the conditions are changing as we see sometimes warmer and wetter spring conditions, we're seeing uh, this white pine needle disease become more frequent and um, extensive. We're also seeing heavy rain, more heavy rainfall events. So this graph is showing the number of days with heavy precipitation over one inch of rain, and you can see um, that there is an increase over time since the early 1900s. And what this can do in our forests, um, heavy rainfall events can erode our soil, uh, could wash away the leaf litter and expose those fine roots that I mentioned um, in the when talking about snowpack. Um, this can actually deplete soil nutrients um, when, when rainfall events are very heavy. And of course, we're worried about the effects on water quality um, too when this happens. We may see um, more disturbance events too. This is really hard for us to model and project into the future because we don't have really good data sets on wind events or ice storm events. But we um, think just with the changing climate, we will see more wind, maybe more hurricanes, um, more things like ice storms where we have um, not quite cold enough temperatures to cause snow events, or maybe we see really heavy snow that comes and it's wet. Um, and causes, you know, this isn't really a problem, heavy wet snow for mature trees. It might break some branches, usually not. It's usually a problem for these really young saplings that sort of get bent over. Um, but certainly uh, ice storms can cause branch breakage and, and topple trees. And all of these events, they're, they cause natural disturbances in our forest. And so they can promote change. They can create spaces for new uh, seedlings and saplings to grow up and, and promote adaptation in our forest. What we're really concerned about um, with these events is infrastructure, houses, power lines, roads, and things like that um, that could be affected, especially with catastrophic um, events. So we have a lot of things going on in our forests. Um, we have longer growing season that can be a benefit. I didn't mention um, CO2, but CO2 is um, one of the greenhouse gases, dominant greenhouse gases, that is contributing to climate change. It is what trees and plants use as their source of uh, uh, to make sugars and starches. They use the sun's energy and photosynthesis and they use CO2. So we are seeing with more CO2, plants are actually more efficient and they can grow more. Um, but then we have the suite of other stressors, other changers um, that are very positive that will cause um, stress 
to certain species, maybe certain ages of trees over others. And we don't really know um, how all these um, changes will interact. And trees, you know, are unique, unlike wildlife, you know, wild animals, they can't get up and move to a more favorable location. So there's sort of three options. They don't survive, right? They perish from these changes, or they can adapt um, to new to these changes. Um, and many of our species are very adaptable, or they can also, along with the adaptation, they can also relocate to new locations through regeneration. So that involves you know, flowering, creating seed, and having that seed um, find a place that's favorable, space to grow, um, and, and grow up. And this has happened in the past. It's, you know, geologic time not that long ago that our region was covered in ice, and we didn't have forests, and forests came back. They came back from where they were in what we call refugia, where many of our species existed down in the Appalachians, um, and they slowly migrated back up. So about 11,000 years ago, we didn't quite have forests. We had, um, you know, this quote, kind of taiga, so uh, a sparse conifer forest. But when we look at the changes in our temperature, so this is showing uh, changes in temperature over time before present. Um, so we had this very rapid uh, change. We had um, the melting, this uh, dotted red line, and I put, I put that into the graph. So that's when the ice sheet melted here uh, in New England. Um, and we had, um, you know, started to have plants um, back in our area. And you can see we were on this, sort of downward trend again, the climate was cooling. Um, but what's really concerning is the rate of change that we're seeing recently. So this, this really um, you know, rapid increase in the temperature is not like anything else these trees, these species have experienced in the past, right? Um, the, the rates of change were much more gradual. And then we also have you know, the situation in our neck of the woods in New England and in the Northeast, we've had a lot of human impacts to our forests. And so it wasn't that long ago, you know, early 1900s, you can see in this graph that Vermont, which is in this red line, um, was had, you know, down to about 35% forested. A lot of our forests had been completely cleared for agriculture, some for development in those areas are, have still remained that way, but um, there was farm abandonment when, when sheep farming and other um, farming wasn't profitable, people moved out west, uh, farms are abandoned, and we've had this incredible uh, resilience of our forests and regrown, and now we're about 75% forested, um, so it is a, an incredible testament to the, the ability of trees to respond to these changes. And, and create forests again. But we have to remember that these forests are very young um, and they are still developing um, over time from these changes. And even places that were not uh, cleared um, for agriculture were often um, harvested in unsustainable ways. We didn't know a lot about ecology um, and have good forestry practices. People went in, they harvested the best trees out of the forest um, they could. And so that left a lot of legacies in our woods where what we call high grading. So taking the biggest and best trees or maybe taking only one species. Um, and we see in our woods, lots of evidence of that. Um, so we have things like altered species composition in our stands. Uh, often we have fewer species represented in our forest than would have occurred um, before these changes happen. So I'll, we even have situations like this uh, left photo, uh, all white pine. It's a very common occurrence in Vermont, old field white pine. White pine's great at growing on old agri abandoned agricultural land. These trees are all the same age, very closely spaced together. And I look at this and I see a very unhealthy forest because um, they don't have a lot of foliage. They look unhealthy, and there's probably not a lot going on in the understory as far as regeneration, species diversity. And this is a forest that is, um, you know, still in development. So we have simpl simplified physical structure because of that. We don't have the diversity in canopy layers uh, within a forest or across a forest. We have reduced age class diversity um, in, our, in our stands. 
And um, we see things like a degraded stand condition sometimes. So there's ex uh, um, effects of past logging example here in this lower photo or old logging roads that were left um, in, a, in the forest. We have things that happen like soil erosion because of land clearing. When you took off all the trees, there was a lot of erosion, compaction. There might've even been tilling if um, animals were grazed or if it was used for agriculture, um, there was significant impacts to the soil. Um, and that created less varied forest floor topography. Um, one thing we know in our forest, we have less dead wood. So less down logs uh, on the forest floor, uh, less standing dead trees than would have other happened otherwise um, occur. And that's just because again, our forests are really young and they haven't had the ability to, um, to develop over time that involves trees dying and other trees taking their place. And so that natural progression. Um, we also have a lot of non-native plants um, and certainly insects and diseases. This middle photo is showing, unfortunately, a common occurrence in our floodplain forest. This is gout weed um, in this forest, and that really does uh, inhibit new regeneration of seedlings and saplings. They just can't get established um, in that competitive um, location. Um, and what we call landscape homogenization, that across Vermont, we have more similarity in our forests just because they are in a similar age class um, than we would have had uh, had forests developed and, and changed and there have been disturbances and all sorts of varied histories over you know, uh, centuries. So we sort of have this condition, we have legacies of past land use, all these other stressors that forests face, and then now climate change. And it set us up um, you know, that we have these forests that could be more resilient um, than they are, and they are sort of vulnerable um, to a lot of these stressors and changes. Um, also, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention the importance of carbon that our forests provide. So our forests are here in Vermont, are a carbon sink. Um, they take in about half of our state's emissions. We're very fortunate to have this, but this ability for our forest to take in and store carbon is dependent on so many factors of the forest. Um, but critically, forest health, the occurrence of disturbance and stressors, uh, forest loss, and climate change itself can inhibit this ability of our forest to provide this mitigation um, impact for us. And so I do want to say that there are things we can do. So if you are a landowner, uh, no landowners um, have the ability to inform maybe your town forest management or um, our foreign policy, right, speak up, we do have ways we can enhance resilience to climate change. So I am going to talk about the things we all we can do um, if we have the opportunity to, to do so. So we know from research that forests with more species, so a bigger diversity of species, and trees, multiple different sizes, ages, conditions, uh, including dead wood, so dead standing, dead logs on the ground, uh, regular gaps in the canopy. So we just want non-uniformity, right? So a forest that is less uniform is more resilient to climate change and other stressors. When it experiences those stressors, those disturbances, not all species, not all trees of the same, uh, trees of different ages, they don't respond the same. So if we have something like a windstorm, insect outbreak, having a diversity of species and ages in the forest, different conditions will mean that there is a forest in the future. And so we have this growing uh, uh, body of work and, and folks that are promoting this of what we call climate adaptive management. Um, and really this is the idea that we're incorporating climate change into our forest decisions, forest management decisions. And the goals really are to reduce this, the forest vulnerabilities and to advance resilience. And so this can include you know, active management you, you do. This also can include it can include conservation, um, restoration of forests to improve uh, their health and condition. So vulnerability is the degree to which a forest is susceptible and unable to recover from climate change. We know that certain forest conditions uh, and disturbances can make a forest more or less vulnerable to climate change impacts. So this is really one of those ideas we need to really assess vulnerabilities on a site by site, site basis. There's no one rule of uh, how our forests are vulnerable, they're all very different because of their species composition, their ages, their land use history, their current management, their site conditions, et cetera. 
And resilience is what we're striving for. It's the ability of a force to adapt, to recover um, and adapt following disturbance or change. So climate adaptive forest management sort of follows this you know, cycle, but really it's this identifying vulnerabilities that are specific to the forest, uh, and then using strategies um, to reduce vulnerabilities if they exist, um, increase resilience, and facilitate adaptation to change. Um, and then really important is monitoring, planning for the unexpected. And so that sort of cycles back um, to the identifying vulnerabilities. And so this goal, though, really the goal here is to keep the forest as forest. It might change, the species mix changes, the ages change, sort of what the forest looks like is constantly changing in forest. We look out in forests and we think they're static. They're constantly moving just at a rate we can't see. And so part of this is helping and facilitating the forest to move in a direction um, that is more resilient and, and healthier. And so what we can do with some of these practices is we can do things like create complexity. So these photos are showing that when we have sort of this non-uniformity of our forest, compare those to the photo I showed of that old field white pine. We can increase species diversity. We can enhance ecological features and habitat of wildlife. Um, we are also in a biodiversity crisis along with a climate crisis. And that's because of losing uh, critical habitat and land degradation. And so we can do a lot to improve those. I was just at a talk today from Alyssa Bennett, who works for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife, about using management to improve roosting habitat of endangered bats. That was really cool about how those could be paired together. Um, we can also do things like designate reserves. So these are areas that um, we want to protect and leave um, and that can be within active management, it can be separate. And we can do things like um, uh, designate legacy trees that are um, to live out their full life cycle and provide a source of seed. We can also sustainably harvest resources with this. So this allows us to provide you know, a local source of products instead of um, you know, getting our products from elsewhere, um, support our local economy, uh, support our neighbors. And so there's a lot of benefits here of doing this in a sustainable ecological way. Um, you know, in the carbon uh, world, we can actually change, move carbon around to different pools. So um, we have different pools of carbon in our forest. We can actually flux carbon into sort of the deadwood pool, um, the soil pool, uh, et cetera and actually get what I call resilient forest carbon. So if we have a resilient forest, that carbon can be stored and sequestered in the future. That photo I showed of old field white pine, one species, not resilient, not resilient carbon. You get a one windstorm, we get one disturbance, that carbon could be lost. Um, and that forest might not be a forest if there isn't regeneration underneath to um, take over. So I've developed um, these 12 steps to climate resilience. And if I'll uh, show the link at the end of the presentation and also I'll send uh, uh, the link um, and you can download a flyer. I also have these like sort of cute little cards they are about this big. I should have grabbed one um, to show you, but um, these little pocket cards you can take out in the woods and I'm happy to um, mail those to you. Um, or if you come to my one of my, my events, I. Give I gave a bunch to Tim, so he has a lot of that <laughs> if you reach out to Tim Stout. Um, and so this is the idea that if you're a landowner, these are just some ideas um, you can take and choose the ones that fit best for you of things you can do to um, include climate change in your um, forest planning. And so really the first one is getting to know your land. Um, this is really critical and, and, and fun, um, especially if you're a new lander, but even if you've owned your land for a while, um, because we know that each that climate change uh, will affect each forest land differently, and so getting to know the land and the, and your and the conditions that land is in is really critical to think about the next step. And you know, one way to do this isn't the only way is to make a map. And if you have a forest management plan, there will already be a map in there, but you could add different things to it. And so it's just thinking about like you know, water resources, where are they? Uh, where are your roads and trails? Are there issues with those roads and trails? Different forest types or species, um, different age classes of forests, or certainly things like invasive plants or areas where you see uh, intensive deer browse, which is a problem in our forests. If whether you wanna do 
active management, passive management, talking to a forester um, is really critical. These are folks that have education and continuing education um, in these topics, and um, they can help you sort of think through and articulate your goals. And certainly if you're enrolled in the current use program in our state, um, you're, you need to work with a licensed forester. Um, and so just could be a good thing to talk, walk through your woods, uh, talk about your goals, and that you want to manage for climate resilience and adaptation. Um, and if you ever need someone to talk to, we do have a great resource in our state with our FPR county foresters, regardless of your parcel size, they will come out um, and talk to you and, and look at your woods. So um, that's a great resource that landowners should take advantage of. So the big step in this is really thinking about your land in its vulnerabilities. And I break these up into three buckets. So the first is our things that might affect the future forest. So this is regeneration. Um, the second bucket are uh, conditions of your overstory trees that might mean they're less resilient uh, to disturbances. And the third is really about ecosystem processes. So these are conditions of the forest that affect the soils and the water quality. So that first bucket, the tree regeneration, these are things like invasive plants, especially really large populations, because they can outcompete regeneration of seedlings and success of those seedlings to become saplings and become trees. Certainly things like animal browse, deer browse is a big issue for seedlings and saplings in our state. We are realizing now um, we have an incredible bottleneck um, in our regeneration class in our forests, mainly because of deer browse pressure. So this can alter the species composition because they like certain species over others, or they can just decimate sort of the entire regenerating class. Um, so if you see only a few tree seedlings in the understory, or maybe, um, you know, only a few species, that's sort of a red flag um, that maybe some interventions are needed. And uh, looking at the overstory trees, so I sort of talked about this with the old field white pine, but things like um, any unhealthy looking trees, but insect or disease damage, but trees that are very close together and have um, small crowns. So you can see in these two photos, those are examples of old plantations, um, which we have commonly through our state. When our state was uh, mostly unforested, people went in and planted trees often very close together. Um, and so they're all of a similar size, similar age, and similar species. And then another thing to really be mindful of, and this is a common occurrence uh, in Vermont, uh, it's nothing to be, you know, it's something that is, is really uh, ubiquitous, is old roads that happened maybe decades ago when folks didn't know that they shouldn't drive tractors straight up a hill, you know, in the woods. And I see this all over the state on public and private land, old skid roads, old uh, access roads. And so oftentimes these weren't closed out with appropriate drainage that cause that allows the water to get off the surface. And so we see things like this, which basically these roads become stream beds. Um, and so there's a, a soil erosion and rutting um, areas of soil that not covered in leaf litter or failing drainages like this culvert. Um, and then another thing, as I mentioned, lack of deadwood. Um, and we want to see that um, in the forest. That's just something that um, we know is good for uh, nutrient processing, cycling, uh, stops uh, erosion. It can hold uh, leaf litter and, and, and so twigs and things like that. And good for a huge suite of wildlife um, rely on uh, deadwood. Um, and so I have a number of strategies that depending on those vulnerabilities you can use. And so the first is thinking about slow spread and sinking water. So instead of what we used to do, you know, decades ago, which was channelize water, water and get it off a site as fast as possible, we know that causes erosion and water quality issues. The best thing is to keep that water in your forest, um, but ensuring any, you know, infrastructure you have can withstand extreme events and minimizing that channeling of water and trying to get that water into you know, places where it can slowly be absorbed and keeping it in the woods. Um, like I mentioned, you can use dead wood to do this, which is a kind of cool uh, free <laughs> technique and provides a lot of other services. Um, one thing I suggest is that you can walk in your woods you know, during a heavy rainfall event or right after, and you'll quickly see where the water is flowing. Um, and along those lines is just doing what you can to protect soils and water quality. So really important, any act of timber harvest, but also if you drive ATVs in your woods, if you have hiking trails, if you have a sugar bush, 
um, thinking about reducing impacts. So avoiding wet, mucky areas, uh, selecting equipment with the smallest impact. Um, anytime the ground is frozen or dry is much better. We know that wet soils compact much more rapidly than dry or frozen soils. Um, as I mentioned, fixing or closing out old roads is really important. And there are a lot of techniques loggers are using um, and foresters are recommending loggers use uh, to reduce those impacts. So using bridges and um, even branches you can put down on the traveled surface um, to reduce uh, compaction. Um, and of course, things like maintaining plants. Anytime you have um, a water source, so maintaining plants along those uh, stream banks, uh, ponds, lakes, uh, wetlands uh, is really important. Um, as I mentioned, we have regeneration issue uh, debt. It's called what we call it regeneration debt in our state. Um, so focusing on regeneration. And this does involve gaps in the canopy. So those trees need space, they need light to grow. And so we do often have to emulate natural disturbances. So this would occur naturally when trees die or when there's a disturbance and that would leave space for these new young trees. And sometimes we have to help the forest um, uh, have this happen more frequently. We can do that through um, timber management. Um, and of course, retaining uh, large healthy trees that can be a source of seed and pollen. Um, and sometimes we have to go in and do some thinning even to um, help uh, trees survive. And this can be particularly important if you have um, other competing plants, like unfortunately beach, uh, American beech sprouts very readily and, and can outcompete other trees. Um, in places that you have high deer pressure, that might be a, a really critical bottleneck to think about ways to um, uh, control that browse. Um, the best way really is through hunting. Uh, there are some other ways, fencing and things like that, but they're really costly. Um, we do know that hunting is it has been shown as a great way to uh, you know, control the, the deer browse pressure. And certainly you can use tree planting, although relying on natural regeneration is really sort of the easiest and best and cheapest thing you can do. Um, I mentioned complexity. We can do this on two levels, species diversity. So keeping those less common species, keeping the diversity you have on site, um, maybe those ones that do well in the future um, are tolerant of changing conditions, but also this idea of structural complexity. And that can happen vertically and also horizontally. So we just want that non-uniformity in our forests, so gaps in the canopy, uh, tree ages, sizes, all this sort of stuff is, is really great uh, for a forest and for the development. Um, and of course, retaining standing dead trees is, is a good one for that complexity. And that brings me to the next uh, step, step eight, which is just increasing deadwood. And like I said, you don't have to do all of these at once. They might not, you know, choose the ones that fit best for you or you're most excited about also that relate to your vulnerabilities. So this is one that's sort of fun to do, um, although, you know, it does create messier woods, but it's easy to do. You can do it on your own. Um, you can girdle trees, you can fell um, trees, leaving logs and, and dead trees where they are, but yeah, you can fell trees and leave them in place. Um, if you have an operator on site, they can actually push over trees with equipment to create a tip up. So that's when the root ball is up in the air. And that's great for a lot of um, wildlife. There's some species um, that require that. Um, we can also, what we call girdle, which is taking a chainsaw and cutting a concentric circle around a tree. I've done this on my property um, and the trees slowly die and create this great um, uh, area where you have a, a, a gap basically, but you have, and so you get regeneration, but you have standing dead trees that can uh, provide a number of benefits. Um, and certainly old trees are great to live out and they can be what we call future, future deadwood. Um, managing other stressors sort of goes along with all of this. Um, anytime you promote healthy, vigorous trees on your, in your woodlot, in your forest, um, you're gonna reduce the impact of stressors, um, but certainly controlling uh, as best you can. If you can eradicate, great, but controlling invasive plants um, so they uh, don't uh, inhibit uh, regeneration. I mentioned animal browse, um, that's a hard one, uh, but even monitoring for that is really important. Uh, and certainly anytime we have a species, a, a diversity of ages and species, we also have a bigger ability in our forest to uh, withstand stressors. Um, one thing that folks are often interested in is this idea of 
future adapted species. And I sort of talked about this earlier, the Southern and Northern species, cold loving and warm loving species. So this is the list of species here for what we have projections for. So in red is this suitable habitat is projected to decline. Again, we're not gonna lose these species, but they'll be more stressed. I did put a little asterisk by sugar maple because it has such a big distribution and a big genetic diversity in the species that we think even though this will, is a cold loving species, we actually think this species is very adaptable. Um, it can grow in lots of different places. And so we're less worried about this species than we are like balsam fir, which has a much more limited range. Yellow is um, suitable habitat will be, uh, be the same. And then green, which is the longest list, I will note, is the species that we think are gonna expand. And I will note that this does not include impacts of uh, insects or diseases. It's just about the climate in the future. So you'll see some species on here that have notable um, insect pressures or disease pressures. Um, so, you know, thinking about if you have these already on site, some of these future climate adapted species, keeping them. My woods are starting to have red oak regenerate in the understory. I make sure to keep those, maybe even making an opening around those oaks so that they have space and light to grow. Um, certainly um, species that depending on your site, you might want to favor species that handle drier conditions like oaks and pines um, or that tolerate um, disturbances. Another critical thing is thinking about protecting anything unique, anything all. It might not even be unique statewide, just unique on your property or special place. And that's really critical. Like I mentioned, we're in a biodiversity crisis. So uncommon plants, plant communities, um, special places, wildlife features like this middle um, photo of a, a snag with cavity holes, right? Um, any water sources, really important to protect. Um, and I will say, you know, there is an importance of thinking about your forest in the future. So thinking about long-term plans for your parcel, um, making sure, you know, ensuring that it remains forest. So thinking about, um, have you thought of um, legacy planning? And there's folks in our state like VHCB um, that can work with you um, on that, on thinking about your, your land. Um, and the last step is monitoring um, and planning for the unexpected, as I mentioned. So this can be, you know, this doesn't have to be like a spreadsheet really detailed, but having a notebook where you know, oh, there was a frost event in May and these species were damaged, or, you know, I had forest tent caterpillar outbreak this year. Um, and keeping track of those things can be really uh, important, especially um, thinking about management outcomes. If you do active management, what does the site look like after a year or five years, right? There's really, we've, we've, sometimes it's hard for us to see that forests are changing, but they do really change over time and develop. There are a lot of technical resources in our state. Um, I am one of them, but not the only one. And so take advantage of things that we have, resources, um, ask questions. There's lots of folks that are willing to help you. And along that line, here is my uh, website. So you can go here and I will send this uh, along. Um, I have a number of resources. I'm sort of growing resources on here. There's climate change resources, there's carbon resources, there's more, more general forest ecology resources um, that range from really introductory um, to a little bit more technical. And this is the, the resource I was mentioning, the managing your forest with climate change in mind and the little cards, but the longer document um, that's available as a PDF as well. Um, and again, there's the website and my uh, contact um, email. And I'm always happy to hear from landowners uh, and folks. So um, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. And um, I will take some questions if there are any. And I guess I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ali. And um... Please, to the people watching, don't worry if you missed the links or Ali's email. I can send that in a follow-up email if you just send it to me, Ali. That'd be great. Yes, I so will can get it. Um, thank you. That was such a diverse presentation and covered so many different facets of the topic. Um, I want to encourage people watching or who didn't hear and join late to put questions in the chat here on Zoom. Um, we have some here already and we can start with those, if that sounds good. Yeah. I can do the first one, Michael. Um, how do warmer temperatures and higher rainfall impact soil pH? What is the dynamic between the impacts of climate change and acid rain? 
Hmm. I'm going to think of that one. So, well, I can talk about acid. I'll talk about acid rain first. <laughs> um, so we, acid rain actually is a, is, is a good story. And I think it's helpful when we get really paralyzed thinking or, uh, you know, sort of scared thinking about climate change. Um, I worked a lot with um, acid rain and the effects on our species here in Vermont. And it is one of those stories that you know, it took some time, but scientists noticed that there's impacts of acid rain. And in fact, you know, that some of those um, impacts, well, they first were noted, acid rain was first discovered in our country in New Hampshire, at Harbor Brook, but some of the first impacts on forests were noted here at Camel's Hump. So this is great paper called Catastrophe at Camel's Hump. And there was researchers here at UVM, Hub Vogelman notably, but other folks that really, you know, they testified to Congress that they collected data and showed that there were impacts uh, to trees and um, and there were changes made. So we had the Clean Air Act, we had amendments to the Clear Act. And some of my research when I was a PhD student at UVM, I showed that there was actually recovery. It took a long time, right? It took decades, actually. Um, we see a recovery in our trees, um, our sensitive trees, sugar maple and red spruce in particular. And we are seeing recovery acid or the acidity of rain has gotten lower. So <laughs> the rain has gotten less acidic and it's almost to the point where we think it was um, pre-industrial time. So that's great. Um, so we're really not worried about acid rain. It's still taking a while for our soils to recover and our water bodies to recover, but we're on track. Um, so I don't think there will be much impact between climate change and acid rain just because acid rain is less of a problem. I have to think about how warmer temperatures and higher rainfall impact soil pH? Um, it's a really good question and one I don't know if I know the answer to that. Um, you know, most of our soils, our forest soils here in Vermont are, are on the acidic side. That's just totally normal. They're not like agricultural soils. So they're in the four pH of four, very normal pH of five, very normal. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if I know, I'll, I'll look into that. I'll follow up if I can find anything. I don't know if anybody's looked into that interaction. There are a lot of interactions from climate change that not, it might not be that anybody's researched it. Um, so it's a great question. Thank you. I just want to second what you never said, what a really comprehensive talk. You always touch on some of everything. Really appreciate that. Um, this question is, I'm from northern New Jersey. Can these yeah. recommendations to help save forests apply to different states? Yes, I think so. And welcome. I didn't realize there would be someone from New Jersey, so glad you could make it. Um, yes, I, these are pretty universal. I mean, some of the stuff I said, you know, Vermont County Foresters, you'll, I don't know exactly what your forester situation is in New Jersey, uh, but reach out to, you know, your state uh, forest office or or if you have an extension service Um in your state, but yeah, these are pretty universal. Uh, we have very similar forest conditions uh, across the eastern seaboard, and that we had, you know, widespread land clearing and sort of young forests, and then forests that have been affected by poor management decisions. And so we can do, you know, all these principles are pretty universal: increasing species diversity, increasing complexity. Um, downwood might be one, depending. In New H New Jersey, does have fire. Um, mediated system. So you have New Jersey pine barrens. So that's the one thing about um, increasing deadwood. We don't really have fire, uh, really dominant fire systems in our state. And so I'm not really worried about uh, increasing deadwood in that fuel loading, but, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that same uh, uh, strategy for, you know, out West where there are uh, a lot of fires, there's sort of a different need there. They're often doing things like thinning the density of the stand to reduce uh, catastrophic fires. So depending on what type of forest you have in New Jersey, um, but the other ones reducing, you know, stressors, uh, monitoring, uh, promoting regeneration, all of those are really universal to all forests. We know that they're um, we, we know that they they exist in old growth stands. And so that's how we know that they're signs of good ecosystem functioning. Um, and we know there were conditions that existed, you know, before um, we did widespread land clearing and, and, and sort of um, maladaptive management. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, we have another question here that I thought might come up. Um, should I do something as the ash trees die on my property? Let them stand, create gaps, favor the saplings. Yep. So we, I, 
had it on the last slide and it's on my website, um, but we do have a couple recommendations for managing ash. Um, so I worked on with a, a couple folks. Um, uh, we have these recommend. It's called 10 steps. I know I love the 10, <laughs> 10 12 steps. Um, it's called 10 steps for managing ash uh, under emerald ash borer and climate change. And we actually did two versions. One's a little bit geared towards a forester audience. So it uses some language that foresters use. And then one we geared a little bit more to a landowner and they're labeled thus. I think I have both of them on my site and I can, I'll send them along. Um, but, you know, as far as um, thinking about, so that's sort of like one, two punch with ash. Um, and so we can have interactions with emerald ash borer um, and ash. Ash is one of the species we actually think will do well in a changing climate if it wasn't for EAB. Um, and so promoting regeneration um, is one thing we think is really important. Ash needs pretty big gaps, at least a quarter acre. It's a species. So different tree species um, have different regeneration requirements. And we usually define these about how much light they need when they can um, establish. So something like sugar maple, uh, eastern hemlock, they can establish in dense understory. So we call them shade tolerant species, but then we have um, other species that are shade intolerant. So they have to regenerate and grow in full open sun. Ash is kind of in the middle, um, but it does need more, much more sun than, than a species like sugar maple. And so we know that for successful regeneration or else it just sort of withers away and doesn't um, persist and needs at least quarter acre gaps. And so you can make those and maybe those will occur naturally um, from mortality, but you could ex uh, accelerate that. One thing that's really critical with ash, there are male and female ash trees. So some trees are both, have both male and female parts. Some are, you know, either male or, or female and ash is one of those. And we know that there are many more male trees than female trees. So it's about like seven to one or nine to one males to females. And so one thing that you can do um, if you see that there's ash seed on a tree. And so it comes sort of later in the summer. Actually, last summer was a very big ash seed year. And so I was recommending landowners and foresters go out, take flagging tape and put it around the stem of those trees so that you remember, because it's really hard. You can't tell the difference <laughs> any other time of year. It's very hard. In the spring, you can kind of tell with flowering, but it's really hard. It's easiest when they have the seed um, in the fall. And so preserving those female trees is really important. So you, what you could do, and this is one of the recommendations, is flagging those and creating gaps near that female tree. So you have an opening, allows that regeneration to happen. And um, I will say the state has released a number of parasitoids that affect the emerald ash borer larvae and or the adult different stages. I think they've released three different species. And so our hope is that, you know, as that parasitoid increases in population, it will sort of control um, the emerald ash borer. We're never gonna get rid of emerald ash borer. So thinking about ways you could have younger trees that are less susceptible to EAB um, is really, yeah, it's really great. So favoring that regeneration um, and preserving those um, female trees, because you don't need as many males to female, um, so you could remove some of the male trees. I'm glad you mentioned about the ratio of male to female ash trees because I'm always looking at the big male flowers and always trying to find the female ash trees. And I, I'm always wondering why are they so hard to find? I didn't realize that was the case. Yeah. Yep. So Thank yeah. You. So keep an eye out for that. Um and they, they don't they won't necessarily have a lot of seed every year. Um, and so it really depends. Yeah, last year was a huge uh, ash seed year. Um, and so keeping an eye out in the fall. And sometimes they'll they'll sort of persist after the leaves drop too. And so that can be a good time to to find them too. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank well, you. Well, yeah, I'll send that link around because there's some other things we included in um, as as some considerations about thinking about ash. That would be great. Um, I don't, I think, I don't think we have any more questions here. Hi, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, if there's, okay. if there's nothing else that you've got in your mind, um, you've really given us a lot of information. 
yeah. okay yeah i'm sure everyone's like and so that's why yeah go to um yeah, i'll send the links along and so a lot of what um you can reference back to that if you've forgotten things or whatever and look back and walk through your woods and sort of think about some of these aspects um in that new context and so yeah i'll i'll share those resources well thank you oh thank you all so right much. well everyone have a yeah a lovely evening you too so, Okay, take care. Thanks everybody for joining us.